What a wonderful world. What a wonderful choir. What a wonderful soloist we had today. Thank you so much. When our staff met to plan our sermon series for this year, I'm pretty sure we looked at our current schedule and thought, you know, after spending four weeks or whatever it was we spent on suffering, maybe we should focus on something a little happier after that. And, uh, and so it's going to be November. Why don't we do a sermon series on Thanksgiving? So that's, that's where we're at. That's why we made that decision. But I think what we didn't realize at the time is how closely connected suffering and gratitude are in the Bible. As we're going to see today, moving from suffering to thanksgiving and to gratitude is really the transition that God wants us all to make. In fact, gratitude is often a really important part of healing. One of the things I said last week was that God doesn't send us suffering. Sometimes the suffering we experience comes as a result of things that we've done, decisions that we've made, and sometimes suffering comes for no good reason at all. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. That's the bad news. The good news is that God is with us in the midst of whatever it is that we experience, but especially in the midst of suffering, and God can even use it for our good. I think a lot of people have this idea of God as some kind of wrathful judge who's just waiting to punish wayward sinners. Not only is that a kind of a common image, I think, of God, it's also been around a long time. People assume that if God is all-powerful, that whatever I experience must come from God. So if I'm unhappy, if I'm tempted if I'm struggling, this must be what God wants for me. Our scripture reading for today from the book of James addresses that idea directly. James wants us to know exactly the kinds of things that come from God and exactly the kinds of things that don't. So our scripture reading today is found in James 1, verses 12 through 18. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then, when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. And this is really our golden verse for the week. This was the, text, this was the part of the text that made us decide to use it for our first Sunday on Thanksgiving. James goes on, Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us, by birth, gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I have a, a pastor friend who does this thing with his church. When he gets into the pulpit, he'll say, God is good, and the congregation responds by saying, all the time. And then he says, and all the time, and the congregation responds, God is good. So let's try that, okay? God is good. And all the time? Very good. He's been doing that for years, and I think it's a, it's a really good reminder of what we just read in James Chapter 1, that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. God doesn't send temptation or evil or suffering. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Now, that doesn't mean we don't sometimes experience temptation or suffering. The world in which we live is designed to tempt us 
it is up to us to determine how we will respond. Like James says, we can be lured and enticed by it. But again, that's not coming from God. That's coming from us. Or we can choose to act in faith. It is up to us. Years ago, I remember reading something about temptation that kind of stuck with me. Uh, it said that only the strongest among us are tempted. Only the strongest. Because everybody else gives in. Right? If you succumb every time you're tempted, is it really even accurate to say that you were tempted? Not really. It would be more accurate to say you had a bad idea and you acted on it again. Right? It's not the same thing. The Bible tells us Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, but without sin. In other words, he had the same thoughts, the same desires that are common to all people, but never acted on them. Because again, temptations don't come from God. They're just a part of being human. What comes from God is the strength to overcome trials and temptations. What comes from God is every good and perfect gift. In the book of Genesis, when Joseph's brothers faked his death, remember that story? And then sold him into slavery? I mean, they meant that for evil. They, they meant him. They wanted him to suffer. They were so jealous of him. Years later, when, of course, he was the second highest leader in, in Egypt, what he said to them, to his own brothers, was what you meant for evil, God meant for good, because that's how God works. In other words, God was even able to take the bad stuff and turn it into something good. And he can do the same thing for us and for others, because that's how God works. We saw that last week in Romans 8. Paul's a, another one who was able to see God's good gifts at work even in times of struggle, even in times of trial. For instance, another one of my favorite uh, scriptures from him comes from Romans 5. He says, and not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. That's why Paul was able to give thanks in every circumstance because he knew God was at work. Even if it was only to build in him endurance and character and hope. That's how Paul chose to see his suffering, and so that's what he experienced. Just like temptation requires a decision on our part, so does gratitude and thanksgiving. And that's why the sermon series on, on Thanksgiving, I think, is so timely, coming right on the heels of this one that we've been talking about suffering. And honestly, we did not plan it this way. It just kind of happened this way. I think it's, it's because gratitude is one of the best ways that we can heal from our suffering, from, from struggle. Henry Nouwen once wrote, The great spiritual call of the beloved children of God is to pull their brokenness away from the shadow of the curse and put it under the light of the blessing. In other words, when we take our brokenness and put it under the shadow of the curse, what we're doing is we're wallowing in anger. We're wallowing in despair. And it doesn't get us anywhere. What it gets us is more of the same. But when we take our brokenness and put it under the light of God's blessing, what happens is our wounds are healed. God is able to use whatever it is that we've experienced then to bring healing to others. In Ephesians 5.20, Paul encouraged early church, many of whom were being persecuted, many of whom were suffering, to be thankful in all circumstances. He didn't say that because he wanted them to, to pretend as if bad things didn't happen. This isn't about denial. He said that because he knew 
that gratitude was a choice. It is a muscle we have to use in all circumstances if we want to continue to be a, a channel of God's blessing and healing in the world. Now, I've seen it go both ways. I, I have seen people who go through some terrible thing and never really recover from it. It's almost as if they've taken their brokenness and they've put it under the shadow of the curse. Many of them also blame God for it, too. I don't know how many times I've talked to somebody who, who's given up on faith because they've experienced something tragic in their life, and they're mad at God, and they've given up. But I've also seen plenty of people, and I know you have too, who've made the opposite choice. I've seen them take their brokenness and put it under the light of God's blessing. This past Wednesday night, one of our members was uh, invited by a church over in Nauvoo to go and to share his testimony, and he's got a really, really good one. Many of you know Doug Ammer, and, uh, or have heard me talk about him before, because I think he's a perfect example of someone who's chosen gratitude over and over again. About eight years ago now, Doug came down with a, a terrible infection. Some of you will remember when all this happened. So for nearly a week, doctors didn't think he was going to make it. Um, I didn't think he was going to make it. Uh, he nearly lost his leg as a result of that infection, lost most of one hand. His recovery was nothing short of a miracle, and his rehabilitation was long and hard, probably one of the hardest I've ever witnessed. But you know what he says now when you ask him how he's doing today? He says, I'm great. I'm fantastic. In fact, I haven't had a single bad day since I got out of the hospital. That's what he says. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that he hasn't suffered. He lost his wife, Tanya, just before the pandemic broke out in March of 2020. Still grieves her loss. But Doug continually practices gratitude. He knows God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And because of that, Doug continues to be a blessing to us. And now to others, too. Lots and lots of others. In some ways, saints like Doug, I think, make choosing gratitude seem easy. But it isn't. It's not easy. I think it's a habit we have to work at. And some of us just aren't wired that way. I want to recognize that. I want to say that out loud. By nature, we're more likely to, to see what's wrong than to see what's right. It's who we are, but that doesn't mean we can't still choose gratitude. So one of my favorite examples of, of this is a woman named Ruby Rapine. She was the uh, very first church secretary I ever worked with right out of seminary. She was the church secretary at uh, Central Christian Church in Kettering for 30-some years, worked with a couple of pastors, including me. She was so well-respected in the church she went to. Very large, very conservative church. Didn't have women in leadership roles, except for Ruby. She sat on their board of trustees. Was, as far as I know, the only woman ever to sit on their board of trustees. But what a lot of people didn't know about Ruby was that she fought her own nature in order to be the person that we knew and loved. There was... I don't know how I exactly to describe it, but there was kind of a mean streak in Ruby, okay, deep down. I only saw hints of it a couple of times, but it was there. But what I and everyone else saw in Ruby every single day was someone who trusted God, who imitated Jesus, and who practiced gratitude and thanksgiving in everything. Even if it didn't come naturally to her, she knew God was good and that is how she chose to live her life, was in response to that goodness. Gratitude is a habit. It may be easier for some than it is for others, but it still has to be practiced. And as they say, practice makes perfect. Or I think better yet, more accurately, practice makes 
progress. I don't know that we ever get it perfect, but we certainly can be moving in that direction all the time. For instance, Pastor Brian plays the piano really, really well. And now I'm watching his kids come along and sing like Ella did today and play the piano. I don't. I can't do that. But it's not because my mom didn't try. I can tell you that. She was a church organist. She was a choir accompanist for decades. She would have loved for me to have played the piano. But guess what? I refused to practice. I would not do it. I used to hide from her so I didn't have to go to piano. Even though I loved my piano teacher, I'd hide. At some point, my, uh, my long-suffering piano teacher, whose name was Maisie, she said to my mom, who, to whom she also taught piano, she said, Suzanne, I think your son might be gifted in other ways. I think Maisie was just trying to be nice. I think she was trying to help my mom understand the fact that I was choosing not to play the piano because it was a choice. I'd, I'd love to have that skill now. Uh, and I had every opportunity to learn that skill, but I chose not to. Gratitude is a choice. It's also a muscle. We have to use it or I think we will lose it. Clinical psychologists figured this out a long time ago. A tool many therapists use is something called a gratitude journal, kind of similar to Dee's gratitude basket. Very similar I, uh, concept. So they ask their clients to write down every day things for which they are grateful, even when they don't feel like it. I know some of you, I've been seeing this on Facebook again this year, people will have something that they'll put online that they'll say, I'm thankful for this today. And they, they use this as a discipline in this, this month to do that. And I think it's good. It works. They say it works even better than medications, even better than talk therapy. I was reading about one young mother who did a, a gratitude journal for a couple of months. And so she began listing off all of the things that she was thankful for and then sharing that with her family. And then afterwards, this is what she wrote. She said, our nine-year-old son responded gladly to my appreciation for him. Our 12-year-old daughter called me kooky, yet she melted into happy smiles whenever she was approached by the new me. But it was our 14-year-old son, Jeff, who really convinced me I had a magic formula. Communication with Jeff had been aggravating. The wall between us was thick and hard and had caused me great concern. Yet after I began sharing my gratitude with him and for him, he left me a short note that read, Mom, it's been nice to be able to talk to you lately. Gratitude works. Even when we're not wired that way. It works. It's a choice. But at the bottom of it all, don't forget this, is James' proclamation that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. God is good. And all the time. Remember that. Meditate on that. And you will truly be thankful.